Emma. Shape it on my soul. The Lord wants you to know you're in the front for a reason. He's placed you in the front. The singers, the worshippers are in the front line and he's put you there. He's put you there not because you're able in yourself to do such a thing. He's put you there, number one, because you said, you said to him, if I'm going to do this, God, use me. Yes. It was a time, I don't know when, but you said, yes, Lord, use me. And he is not one that would forget what he said. And he's promised you he would never leave you nor forsake you. But the war isn't happening back here for you, it's happening right here for you. And often it seems like it's just never ending war. But the walls are coming down in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, Jets, stir up the giftings. Hallelujah. I just saw that um, we're just taking the tent pegs out and we're enlarging our territory. Amen. I just seen that. And also, Beverly, I seen in the spirit that you had an, it was like, is it an archery? Yeah, it'll do, yeah. It wasn't in a bow and arrow, it was the sword of the spirit and it hit the mark. Wow, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Your prayers have been answered. Uh, Beverly, your prayers that have come up before God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Your tears have come up before God. All right, stir, stir up, stir up. Amen. Open up your heart. Come on, Jen. Amen, Bill. Oh, thanks. Um, I just felt like in different parts I could hear instruments. Um, and I just saw that we were like a choir before the Lord. And there's just a big open space. And we were just a choir directly before him. Yeah. Wow. Praise God. Amen. You know, you can see there's, there's a sound going up to heaven from this place. You know? This morning, this evening, just unbelievable. The presence of God. Anything could happen. Things could have all already happened on YouTube, somewhere on Zoom, and God is doing something mighty. He's doing something mighty. David is coming. Thank you. I don't know how this works, actually. That second song, I think, Maureen. What was it? Do you, do you remember? Get the camera on him. Spot the yeah. lights. Why? <laughs> I was sitting just here behind the, the twins, the, the twin set. And um, what have I done? <laughs> oh. I had to hold it. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> That's okay. But I was looking at the little fella down there, Ethan. Now, Ethan's had a lot of prayer. And I was just looking at how remarkable he looked. Ethan, yeah, yeah. And you hit a song there. I don't know what it was. Could have been that. But this little boy was looking backwards and you could just see his eyes start to well up with tears. I don't know whether children know these things, but I believe there's a connection with this boy and God. That that particular song, and you could see it, just the tears well up in his eyes. And then when it was finished, he was just back to looking around again, you know, all happy. But we know this boy's had a miracle and I believe so does he. I'm sorry? Yeah, 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 that's it, that's it, yeah, yeah. And it was like, he knew that, I believe, you know. I don't know how, I don't know why, but he knew that. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's spot on. Thank you, Lord. All that prayers, you know I mean? Carla lives thousands of miles away from here. Is it thousands of miles? Around that, six, 600, 700 miles. She brings her children here, all, all six, to be dedicated. She's connected to this church and all the prayers for that boy. I've had five operations, is that right? Five operations, one when the baby was in here, but she depended on the prayers of the saints in this, in this congregation. And that baby is living today and perfect in every way. 
you know, it's just outstanding. It's all the prayers that carry that whole household, you know. Continue to pray for one another. You have no, no idea what God is doing. You know, sometimes we, we do not know what's happening. And I told Carla today that her testimony, you know, when she gives it, is going to go into nations and there are Christian people around the world, particularly where now it's going into other nations, all our messages, when they listen to her message, there will be a mother who wants to, you know, the doctor will say, no, yeah. you know, um, you can get rid of the child. But on Carla's testimony, that that mother will say, no, God, you know, and get in touch with her or whatever it is, you know. And testimonies are awesome. They overcame by the blood of the oh, Lamb and God. the word of our yeah. testimony. But the church need to stand together in unity. And that's, you know, it's happening here. We see the results. That's only one out of hundreds. Yes, sir. During uh, worship, a, a thought came to me. We're only rehearsing until we see him face to face with our worship. It is going to be glorious. Soon and very soon, according um, when you uh, put it up, uh, when you uh, compare it to eternity, it's, it's soon. It's soon. We're going to be singing 24 hours, seven days a week, <laughs> just in his presence, um, being basked by his love. Oh, wow, the gl glory. So whatever, you, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up because we're almost there. Praise, uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks. Thanks, Wesley, for the encouragement. Amen. Anyone else? Come on, Bill, quickly, and we'll take communion. And yeah, let's got something. The kids are not worried about coming in. They probably took it already. <laughs> I, I just, um, we know that um, we say the anointing break the, breaks the yoke. And I just sense this evening, I could sort of see like a, a thick oil or a presence of the Lord. And it was just penetrating into our lives, into our souls. And it was kind of shifting or trying to shift those things that are not shiftable. It's like boulders or rocks or attitudes or, you know, patterns in our lives and I could just see it shifting tonight and freeing up and uh, wow. sometimes we repent and we renounce and we cry out to God but it's like nothing happens but I, I just sense this evening there's a just a shaking in those things. So, amen. A lot of shaking going on. Is that right, Jen? You want to share something or...? No? Okay. We'll keep it for later, right? Father, we just stand up, please, and we'll take communion. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, Lord, for the mighty work that you are doing, Lord, in individual lives, individually, corporately, Lord God, on Zoom, on YouTube. Those who need a miracle right now, just put, lay your hands on those body parts right now. Uh, God prepares a table. I mean, this is the greatest table that we can have. He prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. There is, there is a miracle at the table of the Lord. There is, there is deliverance, there is salvation, there is wholeness, there is financial breakthroughs at the table of the Lord. Right now, Father, as we believe what you have done on Calvary, we come in agreement, Lord, for anyone out there, Lord, who are lost and blind and hurting and rejected, Lord God. Lord, we reach out for those ones right now, Lord. Those ones, Lord God, who have got uh, bad reports, Lord, death sentences, Lord. Lord, cancel the debt right now, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we break bread, Lord God, that they will see your power. Some of your eyes are being opened right now, even to see things in the spirit right now. Your eyes are being opened, your spiritual eyes I'm talking about. Yes, there could be blind eyes opening somewhere around the world as well. God is, you know, when they broke bread, their eyes were open, so it can be natural eyes as well. Just believe God that he's going to give you 2020 vision right now. God, God can do anything, all things. Is anything too difficult for me to do, saith the Lord? There are some people, People, uh, you know, there, there was no, no eyes, there was no uh, muscles there. God replaced them instantly in the anointing. There's so many testimonies, thousands, millions of testimonies. God is, when he says, is anything too difficult for me to do? If he divided an ocean, how much more can he do to, for you? And he walked on water, he healed the sick, he called them out of the graves after four days. And how much more can he do for you today? Because he's here right now. Father, touch these ones, Lord. 
touch their lives, Lord God. Break the family generational curse or any robbery or injustice that have happened to anyone, Lord, at the sound of my voice, Lord. And as we take communion for those who have gone through injustice, we join our join my, your faith together as I speak, church, for those who have go, gone through injustice. Sometimes it's not even your fault in things you have been entangled with because the bloodline has been con contaminated. That is injustice, church. But when we hold this bread today, that curse is being broken over your life. That family line is being broken over your life. That curse that has been put upon you by your fathers and mothers, knowingly, unknowingly, it's being broken over your life. Some of you can feel like a whole weight has fallen off your shoulders. The, the weight that people have put upon you, even as a child, you know, you had to look after your mother, you got to look after your brother, your sister. This, God didn't make you that way. Just let it go. You are not the savior of the world. Just let it go you, because people are loading things on you because you've been loaded as a child and you're taking the load. You are not the Christ. Just open up your heart and cast your cares upon him and God is going to deliver you and answer your prayers because you cast your cares upon him. You are not the Christ. You are not the deliverer. Re release it right now. You cannot even deliver yourself because he's the one who delivers you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Lord, not to you or to me or anyone else. I can lead a thousand people to the Lord, but I didn't do it. Salvation belongs to the Lord and He'll use anyone to save those souls and He can do it right now, touching those souls. Eyes are being opened, spiritual eyes. People are starting to see Jesus right now. Angels are appearing. Sima, Takina, Takala, Otori, Yedele, Orundana. There you go. The anointing, the power of God is breaking yokes right now. That darkness is leaving your eyes. You can see clearly now. Right now, you can see in the spirit. Right now, in the name. Some of you are going to have dreams tonight. You have never dreamt before. God is going to give you dreams and visions. And he's going to deliver you and set you free in those dreams in Jesus' name. Let us believe that God is doing something right now. And he will continue to do it from this moment on as we eat together in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the power of God is a mighty force to break the strength of the enemy. Lord, as we join, Lord, in unity, Lord, believing the life is in the blood, Lord. Church, you have, if you have no blood, you're, you're dead. But this blood gives you life, for eternal life, the blood, blood of Jesus, his DNA is washing the contaminated blood, contamination that you have been in, your fathers and mothers have been in. God is taking that poisonous, contaminated blood out of you. Things you have done in the past, you will not do them anymore. Even that nicotine, that taste of nicotine is leaving that person right. You won't be able to smoke anymore because you, you'll hate it. You'll hate smoking. You'll do, you will not like that taste. It's like... Like wafers, it's leaving you right now. That demonic spirit that I bound you up to something, it's leaving you right now. You're going to be set free from those drugs and, and even alcohol. God is releasing. You won't have any taste for it. You will see the Lord. Come taste and see that the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever in Jesus' name as we drink together. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, love. This mic will... Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's stand up tonight. Glory to the Lord. What a mighty God we serve. What a powerful praise and worship that was tonight really feel the presence of God in the house. Hallelujah. You're just a mighty God. Mighty God. Hallelujah. I was looking at that name. Um, is it Krishna Swami? Hallelujah. Just sensing that you're going through a battle and the Lord wants you to know I'm right with you. I'm right with you and I'm going to bring you through. I'm going to bring you up into a higher realm of glory. I'm going to bring you up in a higher level of, of restoration, higher level of breakthrough, of victory. I'm going to give you the victory. The Lord says, I see your heart. I, I see the position that you've taken and I'm there to help fight this battle with you. And I'm going to give you the victory. Hallelujah. And you're going to see the enemies cowering. You're going to see the enemies backing off. 
The Lord says, I won't allow you to go through more than what you can handle, but I'm going to make a way of escape. Hallelujah. God is with you. He's on your side. You're not alone. Hallelujah. And Jen, there's a new day, a victory, a new day, and it's fast approaching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's fast approaching a day. You're going to testify. You're going to rejoice the goodness of God and what God is going to do for you. I just see the Lord going to pour in finances to you. Hallelujah. Finances. Glory to God. And God is going to make you whole. He's going to make you whole. He's going to make you whole in your emotions. He's going to make you whole in your mind. You're going to find the goodness of God moving mightily on your life. He's heard your cries. They've come up before His ears and God's going to move on your behalf and He's going to do for you what you can't do. Hallelujah. You're going to have great victory, great victory. And people are going to come to you and they're going to want to know your hope. They're going to want to know the reason why you're serving God. And they're going to be drawn to the Spirit of God in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mighty, mighty God, glory to your name. Just go down this row here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for Sharon. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just get the words, a woman after God's own heart. A woman after God's own heart. It's like it's like I just see Mary. There's an anointing. Mary. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And I just see you sitting at the feet of Jesus and gleaming. God is going to give you a revelation. Revelation. You're going to open up the Word of God and you're going to say, I've never seen this before. God is going to enlighten the Word to you. You're going to find something that you've never seen before. And I just see the Lord going to set you free. He's going to set you free from entanglement. Entanglements. He's going to set you free from even like rubber bands around about you that try to pull you back and discourage you and disappoint you. It's like you're going to break loose. You're going to break free from those situations. Hallelujah. It's a day of victory that is fast approaching you. Glory, glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord says, daughter, don't worry about the ones that are around about you. Don't worry about the ones that are doing things and not doing things. Keep your eyes on me, says God, for I'm sharpening even the call of God upon your life. I'm sharpening even that sword that I've placed in your hand, in your mouth. I'm sharpening even the destiny that is before you and I'm removing the obstacles from your pathway. This is not a day to look back. This is not a day to look to the right or left, but this is a day to keep focus and gaze upon me, says God, for I'm bringing you into new pastures. I'm bringing you into new places in the spiritual realm and you're going to feast on the fatness of the land. You're going to feast on the blessings for I'm going to prepare a table in the presence of your enemies and I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to pour it out for this indeed is a new day, says the Lord. I'm closing some doors behind you and I'm opening a new door. And when I open a door, no man will close it, says God. For I'm going to bless you in the place that I'm positioning you. I'm going to bless you in the new things that your hand is going to take. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Can I pray for you? Hallelujah. Glory, glory to the Lord. I just see that the Lord's just drawing you closer to His heart. He's just drawing you closer to that to that place in His heart. He's comforting you, comforting you and, you're, and restoring you. Just see that there's people that have uh, many times wanted to wound you and I even seen like uh, or deep wounds that have just scarred you, that have wounded you, that caused you to bleed because of the words that were spoken, because of that deep rejection where you felt that abandonment, where you felt that just loneliness where people have walked away from you and just dropped you and you felt so alone and you didn't know what to do. And the Lord says, daughter, I'm pouring my healing balm. I'm pouring my healing balm into the brokenness into your life. I'm pouring my healing balm into areas where you felt where you felt so alone, where you felt just abandoned, where you felt that nobody loved you and you felt that you were just left behind and everyone went forward. But I'm lifting you up this day, daughter. I'm lifting you up out of the places where you felt that you were stuck, where you felt you were hemmed in, where you felt so bound, oppressed, tormented. I'm setting you free today. I'm releasing you from tormenting spirits. I'm breaking the power of that torment right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm commanding every every oppressive spirit. I command every oppressive spirit. Lucia hold. I break the tax of witchcraft that have come against you right now in the name of Jesus. I break every assignment of the enemy in the name of Jesus. 
And Father, I just thank You that You are with her, You are for her and You are not against her, Lord. That You are picking up the pieces of her life and You are bringing Your releases just in time, Lord God. You're a great restorer, You're a great healer and You're gonna move mightily, Lord God, on this woman's behalf, Lord God. For Lord, there's many times when she's felt the battle was raging, the battle was raging around about her and she didn't know what to do, Lord God. But You are the one that comes to rescue her. You are the one that comes to deliver her, Lord God. Delivering her, delivering her from enemies, Delivering her from those ones, Lord God, that would come and want to destroy her life, Lord God. But you are lifting her up this day, Lord God. And great is your mercy. Great is your love toward her, Lord God. You're lifting her up out of that miry clay and you're putting her feet upon the rock to stay. And you're putting your song in her mouth, a song of praise and worship unto you, Lord God. You are touching her today, Lord God. And you are releasing your power and your glory upon her, Lord God. And I just see the Lord severing you from soul ties that are trying to destroy you. He's severing you from things uh, uh, that, that were behind you. He's releasing you and setting you free. And He's putting your feet upon that rock, upon the rock of stability, upon that anchor, that rock, that stabiliser. Hallelujah. And the Lord's doing awesome things. I just see He's cleaning out, cleaning out things that people have come to just uh, cause havoc. He's cleaning the house. He's cleaning you in on the inside. And I just see the blood of Jesus washing away washing away everything that would come to contaminate, everything that would come to stain. The blood of Jesus is washing away and cleansing you and just bringing healing into your heart, into your emotions, into your mind. The Lord is just bringing peace. The peace that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. God is going to restore what the locusts have eaten. Bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord says, son, I love you. I love you, son. And I just see the Lord, Shannon, taking your hand. He's saying, come on, son. I want to take you up higher. I'm going to take you up higher. Where the wind begins to blow, winds of adversity begin to blow. But you're in safe hands, says God. Keep your eyes upon me. Keep your hand in mine. And I'm going to lead you and guide you along the, the still waters. I'm going to give you rest. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you restoration, says God. And I'm going to bring financial blessings and blessings that you know not of. I'm going to cause even relationship things that have, have even come to hurt you you and, and cause great pain. I'm going to cause those relationships to be healed and restored. And I'm going to bring you into that new place that your heart's been crying out for. Your heart's been desiring, says God. I'm bringing you into a new season that you've never been in before. A new season that you've never walked in before, says God. Keep your hand on the plough, son. Don't look back because I'm taking you higher. New level of glory, new level of power, new level of fire is upon you, son, this day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord a clap. Amen. God is doing something mightily. So don't forget the transformation meetings, trying to make it. Uh, we are there every day from um, switch on to YouTube, not, not here, but switch on to get on to Zoom every day from, from Friday to uh, and Friday to Monday. <laughs> okay, so try and make it and six hours on Saturday as well. Try and from six to 12, please. Um, God is doing great things, church. You've got to come and get, get, in, get in touch or connected or whatever word you want to use because heaven is connected to our Zoom meetings. That's why we call it transformation meetings because lives are being transformed every day. Um, don't worry if you're, don't feel guilty if you can't make it. Okay, we'll, we'll pray for you till you make it. Um, <laughs> And also we'll pray for the tithes and offerings. Father, we just thank you for everyone, Lord, who have been supporting us right through, Lord, this, this time, Lord, right through COVID, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Bless every household, every family, Lord, who have been standing with us, Lord God, all this time, Lord, in their prayers, intercessory prayers, praying for Yara and me and for the church. Lord, what you are doing in the transformation meetings every day, Lord, lives have been transformed. Lord, we thank you that the, Lord, the money is going into good ground, Lord God, and everyone, Lord, whatever they put into this bag today or into the bank, Lord, that they have been doing, Lord God, Lord, bless them, remember them today, Lord, remember them today when you grant favour to your people, Lord God, prove it to them this coming week, Lord, this year, Lord, let it be the greatest moments of of their life, Father God, that you pour out a blessing that they will not have enough room to contain it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Just go and fill all the bags up, the other, other big, bigger, bigger buckets. I mean, 
Let it overflow. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for standing with us at this time. Okay, Norm, when you're ready. 20, 30 years ago, I was always fascinated with how does discipleship actually work? I wasn't that, I mean, I've gone along to Bible college and things like that, and I found it um, completely just focused on, I, I don't know, it just to, didn't seem to fit very well with um, my thinking of what it, the way Jesus did it. That's what I've been trying to discover. And um, the way I've been learning is that we need to know his word very, very well. But the word of God is meant to transform us. And that's usually the big problem. Maybe I'll back up, explain it. The way that the rabbis teach it is that you have to get wisdom, knowledge, and then intimacy gives birth to emotions. Now, wisdom is like that little spark of revelation, you know, when God speaks to you, you go, oh, by his stripes I'm healed. And you, you get this thing inside you, you go, oh, wow. And then um, what you're meant to do is spend some time getting knowledge, as in researching, studying, getting in the Word. And if you spend time talking with the Holy Spirit, this is the way it's meant to work, it actually changes your emotions. Until it's not, I believe what he said, it's like, I know what he said. Amen. And that's the big missing piece that we haven't got. It's like, we haven't been transformed by his word. We know his word, but we haven't been transformed. And so you've got to spend time in those three areas, wisdom, knowledge, and then intimacy, intimacy, that gives birth to the right emotions. If you're in fear, if you're worried, if you're prideful, if all these wrong emotions are coming up inside you, it, it tells me that you haven't spent the time being transformed. And there's no, no guilt or condemnation there. It's like you have to, discipleship is discipline. It's hard work. And a lot of us don't want the hard work. We like to come to church and get the nice fuzzy message that tells us everything that we are. And um, it makes us feel good during the service, but when we go home, <laughs> it's no good. We need to become the Word made flesh. That's all, all I'm saying. Now, I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach what Jesus teach tonight. Taught. I'm not that good at English. I, I um... <laughs> You're confusing me. Go away. <laughs> so, okay, you know you've got your 40, you've got your um, Gospels. There's 89 chapters. We tend to focus on 12 chapters out of the whole 89 chapters of the four Gospels, which is the crucifixion. That's really, it's vital, it's awesome. But what about the rest of it? That's only 13.48% of the Gospels is talking about his crucifixion. But Jesus' teaching is the teaching on how to enter into the kingdom of God, how to bring the kingdom here on earth. And I honestly believe if we return ourselves to the teachings of Jesus, we will see revival in the land. Because he, he didn't come to die on a cross so that you... Let me rephrase. He didn't come just so that you, when, if you believe that He died and rose again, you go to heaven when you die. His mission is actually to bring heaven on earth now. Amen. And that's what I'm hoping to, to get across here. If I was asked most believers, what is the most important teaching of Jesus? Like, if you could sum it all up, what's the most important thing? The kingdom is sort of the general idea. But th this scripture is actually talking about if you are doing everything else but missing these three things, you've missed it. So I think maybe it's important we understand it. So let's, let's go back. Camera four. Sweet. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weighty matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Just switch, yeah, cool. Um, now, okay, okay, that, let me sort of put it into a, a modern context. Now, I only really want to focus actually on the word faithfulness. Because it's like if we learn how to walk and what Jesus wants, this to me is going to bring out the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'll, I'll put it into my own modern way. 
I like to preach like Steve Hill. Woe to you, pastors, theologians, and those that call yourself disciples. You actors. That's the word for hypocrites. It's like, you know, you've got all the external stuff going on. You show up at the prayer meetings, you know all the scriptures, but, uh, and you, you take care of, you know, you focus on the, the tithe and how much you get in return. You love your worship songs and winning souls. I mean, these are all good things. You focus on things like end times and exalting, you know, the, the things that make you feel good, but you've neglected the really, really, really important things about what the Torah is actually all about, which is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. That's the way I'd put it in a, in a modern thing. And we seem to like to get caught up. Uh, let's keep going. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. It actually comes from Jesus' is quoting out of Micah 6, 8. So the other topics, like worship, is extremely important. Tithing is important. All the stuff is important. But if you've neglected these three things, it's like you've missed it. Jesus identifies the weighty matters of Torah as justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So this is Micah 6, 8. Closer look. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, the historical context of this is really important. I'll just read this. The prophet Micah uttered the statement back in the days of King Hezekiah. Micah worked in tandem with the prophet Isaiah on a mission from God to influence the kingdom of Judah towards repentance. It was a rescue mission they both saw that the doom of exile and destruction hung over Jerusalem the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. It was too late for Israel as the Assyrians took them away, but there was still a chance to save Judah. This should sound familiar. In the days of Jesus, he came along preaching basically the same message, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you don't repent, there's going to be consequences. And I would actually say that if we don't return to the path, there's consequences today. This message actually applies to us as well. Micah and Isaiah was trying to influence their generation to repent in order to merit the kingdom and avert terrible impending impending punishment, destruction and exile. But where the generation of Jesus' time is unwilling to heed his message of repentance, the generation of Isaiah and Micah did heed. They listened and they repented. It's a dramatic story of one of the most dramatic moments in the whole Bible when the Assyrians came against Hezekiah's kingdom Jerusalem is the last city standing and the Assyrian army has it surrounded. But God intervenes sending the angel Gabriel, strikes the Assyrian army and sends them retreating from the land. Pretty cool. So it's like, it doesn't matter how bad it looks, if we return, God will do incredible things. So in their time, the, um, the Assyrian culture was coming into Israel trying to assimilate them. It's the same as happening right now. If you sit on your television set, your TV is trying to assimilate you into their culture and normalise and make it think. But the Christian culture is meant to be very different from everything else. They had economic success under their alliance with the Assyrian. They bought wealth and health. They, this brought about religious apathy and apostasy. Now, I, I learned this too. The biggest weapon against the body of Christ is prosperity. You go, whoa, what are you talking about? Materialism, when you're happy and content, you're, you become lazy. Oh, well, we don't need to study the Word. We don't need to push into the prayer meetings. We don't need to push into church and things like that because it's like, hey, You know, it's pretty good. I mean, everybody here in Australia is actually, compared to the rest of the world, we're the best country in the world, as far as I can see. Um, The prophet came against the people of Judah. Micah walked naked and barefoot to make a spectacle, showing the people what it's like to be led away into exile, captive in chains. So, Isaiah decried religious hop 
hypocrisy. He lamented thus, saying, "The Lord, people, the Lord, the Lord's people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me." He rebuked the nation for injustice, bloodshed, debauchery, and apostasy. They offered good news and hope to temper their fiery message by pointing towards the hope of the future redemption. So that's sort of the bit of the background. Now, in those days, they, the people thought, oh, if we offer enough sacrifices, if we come and show up for all the prayer meetings, if we worship God and give all these things that He likes, then that's going to cover everything else that we're doing or we're not doing. Now, God was quite upset with that. And it's like, it's a good thing to worship. It's a good thing to give tithes. I mean, I love worship. I've so a lot into the worship of this church. I, I want to see it come up high. It's awesome. But we can't neglect these three things. Um, this is Isaiah 1, 11 to 15. What to me is this multitude of sacrifices, saith the Lord? I've heard and had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats when you come to appear before me. Who has required of you trampling of my courts? Now, it's not saying here that sacrifice is wrong, but it's wrong if you're not putting the things in the right order. It needs, the heart stuff needs to be sorted out. You need to learn how to walk humbly or faithfully with the Lord your God. You need to know how to show love and mercy and kindness to each other. You need to know how to walk in righteousness, bringing justice. It's like coming to prayer meetings, praying for each other, encouraging each other. This is all justice. When you see somebody that's suffering, you go and you, you intercede for them. They're the, the three things. Did, did you see, see what I'm getting at? It's like, yeah, let's keep going. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make my prayers, many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. I, I, did, I mentioned this in um, the communion the other day. If you've got iniquity in your heart, God will not listen. So this is like, I want my prayers to be answered. So I need to deal with repentance. The only thing is going to fix the problem is real repentance. Wash yourself. Make yourselves clean. Remove the exile of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. It's like, you know, how many people in our church are suffering because it's like um, marriages are broken down or they're single parents or they've gone through hell. Justice is to plead their case to see them restored. And that to me is that prime mission of this church is to restore the believer to their right standing with God and restore the families. Amen. So, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Micah 6.6. 6. In Micah 6.6-7, 6 the nation of Israel replies sarcastically to the Lord's charges with a series of rhetorical questions. The questions cynically imply that God is un unappeasable, no amount of sacrifices would win his favour. The nation already offers countless birth offerings, extravagant offerings and yearly calves. Thousands of sacrificed rams, rivers of oil poured out over grain offerings, and an endless liturgy of sacrificial services in the temple. In other words, it doesn't matter how big and wow your worship service is, you've got to get the things right. If those sacrifices are insufficient to compensate for iniquity, what would be sufficient? Israel did not understand what to do 
sorry, Israel did not understand that to do righteousness and justice is desired by the Lord more than sacrifice. Proverbs 21.3. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel 15.22. If God cannot be pleased with temple sacrifices or worship services, what does he require? The nation rhetorically throws the problem back to Micah, sarcastically asking, shall I present my firstborn for rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah responds with a disarmingly simple equation. Uh, Here we go. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8. The Lord's favour cannot be purchased with extravagant sacrifices. I mean, how many times have I heard people like they've given so much in tithes and offerings and, you know, they're like demanding a return. But this is, <laughs> it's like, why are you doing it anyway? The Lord's favour cannot be purchased with extravagant sacrifices. Micah says that the Lord requires justice, which is mishpata, mishpat, kindness, chased, and to walk in humility, hatsnia before God. No amount of sacrifices can compensate when those basic principles are absent. Micah's summary of God's expectations echoes the words of Moses in Deuteronomy. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for good. Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13. So mishpitet, let's just define these three words that Jesus talks about. Um, Mishpat, the word mishpat means justice and judgment. In the biblical sense, justice is more than simply punishing the guilty and exonerating the innocent. It includes social justice, looking towards the needs of the disenfranchised, the poor, the widow and the orphan. We all need to learn how to minister to those that need justice. I mean, intercession is a big one. Counselling is another big one, but you need to learn how to counsel. Um, Praying for each other. Chased. Translators often render chased into English as loving kindness or mercy. Judaism assigns the same semantic value. In Micah's day, however, the word also implied covenant devotion faithfulness and loyalty. It's like, are you faithful to God? It carried an expectation of reciprocates. <laughs> yeah, that word. To, yeah, I wasn't good at English at school. I'm still learning English, that's pretty sad, isn't it? God for all his goodness and faithfulness. Now this is the one I wanna focus on, Hatsnia. It's where we get sneers from. It's, uh, in Judaism, the word hatsnia means walking in humility and modesty, the opposite of arrogance, braggadocious behaviour, such as boastful pride or flaunting one's assets. The person who walks humbly before God exercises a healthy fear of the Lord, continually mindful of God's watchful eye and overwhelming presence. It's really important to get this. So it's like everything you do, you do with an attitude. God is present and he's watching me and he, he's with me. Um, his behaviour is not ostentatious. He walks privately with Hashem, God. It's like, it's like well, we don't, you know, the story of Jesus, like, you know, the, the guy on the street corner going, oh, look, at you know, he prays like big prayers so everybody can hear him. And then the person that prays in secret just so his father can hear. It's like, what did Jesus say about it? This is the same idea. Uh, fulfill his commandments in an unassuming manner, privately, without great publicity. The Talmud regarded Micah 6 a as a summary of all the Tom- Torah's requirements. That's the Bible. Michael came and reduced the commandments of Torah down to three principles. Jesus calls these qualities the weighty matters of Torah, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Matthew 23, 23. Micah 6, 8 has a strong resonance 
with the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, our master came instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously and godly in the present age, Titus 2, 11, 12. He taught us to conduct ourselves with mishpat. Let me just jump down, sorry. He warned us to not be like the Pharisee who boasted of his righteousness when praying before the Lord, or like those who have been seen in the markets in flowing robes, greeted with reverent titles, praying on street corners to be seen by men. Instead, he taught us to lower ourselves like the tax collector who smote his breast in prayer of contrition because of those who lower themselves will be lifted. The first will be last, the last will be first. God is opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. For that reason, a person should walk before God modestly and discreetly and humble himself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at the proper time. This is 1 Peter 3, 8, 9. To sum up all of your harmonious, sympathetic, sympathetic brotherly, kind-hearted and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead for you are called to be Called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. I need glasses. Hopefully that explains it. Mark 12, 33 to 34. So this is, um, and to love him with all the heart, with all thy understanding, with all thy strength, and to love one's neighbour as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now you can see that it's like he's saying here, that if you walk in this loving kindness towards others, if you walk in this, then the kingdom of God is not far from you. This is Hosea 6.6. 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Micah 6.8 has strong resonance with the teachings of Jesus. He taught us to conduct ourselves this way. So let's just have a look at this uh, sneot, which is uh, the, the last one, translated as modesty. The convention way it is used in Judaism today is generally to refer to modest dress standards for men and women, but primarily f for women. It was used broadly to refer to rules of proper speech about issues pertaining to sexuality. And it, does that make any sense? Like it says the same thing in Ephesians. We've got to be really careful how we talk. It says no, no filthy or corrupt talk come out of your mouth. And unfortunately, I see a lot Australians are, are really good at being, we're, we're good at mucking around and saying the improper thing to try and get a reaction. Um, it's not all bad, but um, we just got to be, change our speech standards so standards of discretion and conduct between the genders. Okay, what, what does that mean? I see one of the biggest things, the dangers that are happening in the church at the moment is we don't have any boundaries when it comes between men and women. And you go, oh, you know, what, it, that's not fair. And I see that this keeps getting torn down. They can say, oh, I can resist sin. And it's like the Bible doesn't say resist, sem resist temptation, does it? It says flee from temptation. <laughs> it's like, was it Potiphar's wife and um, jo Joseph? He didn't just like, you know, she, she dropped her stuff and it's like he, could, he, he ran. And I mean, that should be an instruction to all of us. We've got to be careful. You shouldn't be men and women. I remember when I was at Brownsville, they made this very, very firm because it's like they need to stay away from that. I wasn't allowed to get a lift home with somebody else if they're a female, even if they're married, um, it's just like, whoa, it's like, because it's like, it doesn't look good and it could end up being a real mess. I read a, a book once, um, there was a young guy that was holding a revival, a tent revival, and it was people were getting saved and all this stuff. And what happened is this, this young lady actually wanted to get counsel with him after the meeting. So they went away in a private room to do counsel. Now she liked him, so she made an advance on him. And when he pushed her away, she was really hurt. So what did she do? She, she, she complained. It ended up going to court. 
it destroyed the whole revival. And when it came down to the thing, she repented and she said, I was so embarrassed by being rejected. I mean, the whole thing could have been averted if there was boundaries put up to stop that sort of thing going on. I don't care who you think you are, if you think that you can resist temptation, you're a fool. <laughs> you need to flee temptation. Billy Graham wouldn't even get in a lift. Billy Graham wouldn't even get in a lift. Yeah, that's good. Don't give you a telephone number. Yeah. Um, a lot of rabbis won't even shake the hand of a, another. If a lady comes up to shake the hand, they won't. They won't. Because it's a matter of, of schneos. This is this keeping boundaries. And, and it's like that sound, it might sound um, ridiculous to us. Yeah, but yeah, it sounds ridiculous. So it won't even shake the hand of the opposite sex. Now, I've done a lot of study on this. And I thought, they're nuts. I mean, in their synagogues, they have a, a curtain. And men are on one side and women on the other side. Think, oh, that seems like outdated there, whatever. But when you actually study why and what it does to them for marriage, we're, we're the ones that are nuts, is my conclusion. Because they, they, they have a, I know I'm going off subject a little bit, but before they even get married, they won't even hug or kiss another person. Their first hug and their first kiss is from their husband or wife. And it's so special and precious. It's like they've built up this, it's like this privacy thing that it makes the union actually work properly. It's like they're able to come together as one. And this is what we're all about, isn't it? Isn't it about intimacy? We want intimacy with God and we want intimacy with our husband or our wife. Because the secret was, and this is Paul talks about, this is like, this is the mystery, that you know, as a husband, man and woman become one, one flesh, and that one flesh usually can't come together as one flesh because it's like half of our soul's been sold to somebody else, we've given this part away, we've been hurt with this thing, and then when we try to come together, it's like, Ugh. it just doesn't work because we haven't protected or put boundaries up it, it's just like, it's the same as when we come to God. It's like we can't connect to God because we've got daddy issues or we got, um, oh yeah, we felt rejected by other people. So it's like we feel God's going to reject me. And I've studied a, a lot about this, but um, sorry, I'm going off subject. The, the idea of dating does not work, it actually sets you up for failure. And, and I mean, that might sound really harsh, but it does. The, the, um, the, the way that the Jewish community does it is like if you want to get married, you sit down with a potential other person. Like you don't go out and oh, try and fall in love. You sit down with the other person and you find out, well, okay, how many kids do you want? What do you like? What do you dislike? And all these things. And then they fall in love. And it, it sounds nuts, but it actually works. I mean, how many... Uh, the, the biggest problem that's happening in the church and in the world at the moment is marriages don't work. Mm. I mean, I was talking to, I won't say, but somebody to do with work. And I mean, the guy's in near tears because it's like all of his three sons, their, their, their lives are messed up because they don't know how mm. to actually connect and become one with another person. Because they, they've set themselves up for failure because they don't know this whole idea of walking humbly before you God or schneers is missing. And to me, we need to understand it because it's the core of, it's one of the three cores of what Jesus said. It's like, it's not so much about what you believe, but what you do. And Jesus is concerned about our conduct and how we conduct ourselves one with another. Him in the centre of each and the core of three strands. Yeah. Yeah, I heard a, a really cool thing about in Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word for um, woman is um, ish, I think, and then man, and when you bring them together, it creates the um, Hebrew word for fire. It's bad. But you add God's name in the middle of it and it yeah, becomes yeah. what it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Fair. Um, I honestly don't believe that you can experience true intimacy with another person without God. Amen. Yes. 
that you, you prepare yourself for marriage by getting your heart right. You, you get rid of the, the baggage as we heard this morning <laughs> so that you can actually become one. And it's meant to be uh, precious and special. Well, we've been taught it's about us, it's not. Marriage. <laughs> yeah, people, today's people are taught it's all about me. Yeah. The whole world revolves around me. Yeah. Marriage is the same, it's the world about them, it's not. It's not a 50 50 relationship, it's a 100% giving relationship. Absolutely. Relationship with God. We Good don't, message. We <laughs> church to see what ministry God's going to give with me. I come to church, hopefully, to minister to my Lord and Saviour. In doing so, it's not about me, and that's what this relationship marriage Yeah. Well, the key to being a disciple, a minister of God, and this is out of the Hebrew, is, um, oh, I've forgotten the word now, but it means becoming nothing. It, it's, I heard this really good story. A lot of Christians, they go to Bible college so that they become something. It's like, I want to be a preacher. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want people to... And it's just, it's actually the totally opposite of what God intends you. I, the way that they do it is that you go to study to become a nothing. Because yeah. it's like, the more empty I become, the more he can fill me. Amen. And that's the way it's actually meant to work. Yes. It's like, marriage, I'm not an expert by a million miles, but... This is where I've learned. It's like when you become a nothing and they become everything is when it works. You get blessed out of yourself. Yeah. Don't it's like... Don't ask tamales. Don't get Tamaris involved. <laughs> 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 she, she's... She's uh, busy making a list. <laughs> she's, she's got... I'm learning so I can actually become a better husband. Um, <laughs> but... I must decrease so he can increase. Amen. It's the same idea, but this is this, again, this is one of the three, this is what I was trying to get through to you, maybe this is a good, good track. It's like the key to intimacy is not, this is what the rabbis teach, the key to intimacy is nothing. You know, what's nothing? No things. I don't, it's like love is not a thing. And actually one of the biggest idols we have in, in um, Western society is love. It's all about love. Love is love. And it's like all our songs are about love. It, that's the idol. And it's like when you pursue love, it will, it will disappoint you. But if you pursue the other person, the result is love. Yeah. It's like you, love is meant to be the fruit, not the, yeah. the goal. It's like the, the rabbis teach, um, you know, two people fall in love and they want to get married. And he would say, why do you want to get married? I mean, you've got love. Why do you want to get married? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yeah. And it's like, then they get married and it's, it's, it, it's, well, the problem is that what happens when the love goes up and down? It's like, well, then I don't want you because I haven't got the love. So you've married them for the love. It's like, you know, oh, I marry you because of your money. You got a lot of money? Let's get married. <laughs> it sounds really selfish, but it's no different than love. Yeah. It's like, no, if you marry the other person because of who they are, then it doesn't matter about the money or the love, and they're just the, the, the byproduct. It's like we serve God not because of what God's going to do for us and what he's going to give for us and we're going to go to heaven when we die. We, we, we serve God because he's God. He loves you. Because he's amazing. He, loves you. He, he laid his life down for us. Yeah. We're meant to lay our lives down for him. Take up your cross and follow me. Amen. So it's like when you you put the right, right things in the right order, then the results will work. You know, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all these things. We're, we're following. So you don't get married for love. You get married for the other person. The result will be love. Anyway, that's off. Okay. Where was I? <laughs> um, I can't emphasise enough the idea of putting hedges and boundaries around your life before you're married and even after you're married. Mm. You need to be very, very careful. You cannot, um, and I, I see it in lots of churches. I've had a lot of experience with churches. The amount of destruction that comes in churches because there's no boundaries. Yeah. Um, 
it, it will ruin ministries. Um, it ruins people's lives. Uh, I, I just read what I was saying. Standards of discretion conduct between the genders, such as rules of not being isolated with someone of the opposite gender other than wife or family, the rule of prohibiting physical contact before and even after marriage. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I try to practice that too. Not because I don't like hugs, I love hugs, but from my wife or my mum, my brother, it's cool. Rules against public displays of affection and few other matters governing interactions around sexuality and affection. All of that good stuff that helps elevate sexuality separates us from the world and hedges against sin. I, I, I learned one thing about biology, that when you physically touch somebody for more than so many seconds, it actually makes a biological reaction inside your body that you secrete certain, and it, and it, it gives you emotions. And so it's like, you know, you, you need to be careful about touching other people because it's like it's, you, 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 they might jump on you, a demon. Yeah, um, you don't want to be connected for the wrong reason. Uh, all stare into somebody else's eyes. I mean, it's dangerous. But anyway, let's keep going. So let's back to this um, walking humbly before your God. Sneos, or sneot, does not flaunt itself. It does not seek to draw attention to itself. It is the opposite of the natural human tendency to put oneself forward and making one's the center of attention. It's like in the prayer meeting or at church, we don't make ourselves the center of attention. You've got to be careful even with testimonies, that the testimony is about God and what, how good he is, not because oh, I went and did this and then so God moved. It's like, well, you're shifting the attention back to you instead of God. And it's like, Everything makes him the centre of attention. You're, you stay out of the picture. Um, it's more than dressing modestly. Actually, you can dress. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll jump. Um, so this is what the Talmud teaches about it. And I like that the Talmud is actually the teaching of the rabbis to their students. So it's really good to see how they actually see things. This is what they say. To walk humbly with your God refers to walking in funeral and bridal processions. So if you're walking in a funeral procession, do you want to dress up so that you become the centre of attention? No. You're meant to walk behind the coffin because they are the centre of attention. Well, what about a wedding? Do you dress up more than what the bride? Oh, yeah. Do you want to you know, have a better dress that you know, draws the attention to you instead of the bride? That's the opposite of what should happen. It's like, do you, um, okay. It's not a place to be frivolous or flirtatious either. You're not supposed to be the centre of attention. The, all the eyes are meant to be on the bride and groom. The Talmud says if the, the Bible tells us to conduct ourselves with humility in public, like in funerals or weddings, how much more is it necessary to conduct ourselves in private matters that require modesty. Um, sorry. Uh, Jesus taught us to take the lowest seat, to be like a child, to be poor in spirit, because the first will be last and the last will be first. He taught us not to jockey for rank, nor demand our rights or privileges, but defer to others to seek to serve rather than be served, to lead through servanthood. So you want to be the greatest in the church, become the servant of everyone. Jesus taught disciples to show mercy, repay evil with good, turn the other cheek, forgive their trespasses. A great deal of what Jesus taught comes under these categories of walking humbly with the Lord your God. Now, I'll just finish up with this. Does anybody notice there's a difference between the Matthew and Micah thing? One says, Jesus said, um, justice, mercy and faithfulness. But Micah says, justice, mercy and humility or walking humbly. Anyone see that? Well, it's like, okay, this is a little bit complicated. But Jesus is a great, he knows the word really well, really well but 
Faithfulness is actually linked to humility. If you look at Habakkuk 2.4, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So the, this passage, Habakkuk contrasts pride with righteousness. Do you see that? The proud person's soul is not right with God, but the righteous will live by faith. So faith then is the opposite of pride. Jesus uses the term to include and encompass the concept of walking before God in humility. So it's like to say that if you're in pride, you're not in faith. If you're, um, yeah, does that make sense? That, that's kind of, that's it. Does that, yeah.